Brenda Ferrer, and uh, thank you for coming. I'm wondering if I need this. Is it better with the mic? It is better. Fine. I will use the mic then. Um, so we're here to talk about storytelling for TV. And I want you to consider, first of all, why. Let's try this here. To go forward and backwards. Oh, it doesn't, um, it doesn't advance forward and backwards. Oh, it doesn't. No, it's not going. Hmm. There. What, what did you use? Oh, you have to go to each one and do that. Okay. Maybe, can I tell you when I use a different one? Which one? Okay. That's fabulous. Thank you. Um, okay. So context, first of all, starting with some real basics. Why stories are so important for, for TV, for video, and as you know, it's a very primal, early form of communication. We've always told stories, and that's been the way we've engaged each other over, over centuries. So when it comes to television, especially now, because there are so many choices, um, you can watch video anywhere. You can watch video on your watch, you can watch video on your tablet, you can watch video on television. So if you're going to engage an audience, and it's all about audiences, it's terribly important. And I'll tell you a, a bit about my background, how I came to my interest in storytelling and television. Um, for many years in Canada, I was a, an investigative producer with The National, which is our main television news program. We, ha we have two key TV news programs at night, and The National is with the public broadcaster, which is the equivalent of RAI. It's uh, CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. So after that, um, I continued work with CBC, training journalists at CBC, but I also continued at a university in Toronto, Canada. And whenever I say Canada these days, people say, oh yes, Justin Trudeau. You know, I get comments about Trudeau, and especially Trudeau's hair for some reason. A lot of people seem particularly taken um, with Trudeau's hair. Now I have to ask you, because I'm speaking in English, can I, guess, can I get a show of hands? Um, how many people here, is it a problem? Because just ask questions and I'll say things slowly, or um, si vous voulez, je peux parler en français, ou si, si vous avez, avez des questions, um, ein bisschen Deutsch, auch. <laughs> So if anything's confusing, just ask me in whichever language you'd like. And uh, except, um, unfortunately, you know, mi, uh, mi dispiace, non parlo italiano. So I, I'm not able to do that. But anyway, um, storytelling. We know that it's terribly important. Stories are important because they, they connect. They engage our audiences. Um, now. I want to talk a little bit about what, what TV does well. And maybe I can ask you, because it's a big group, but it's not so big that I can't ask you questions too. So what would you say are the particular strengths of TV? And I'm talking both about legacy TV and possibly about video you might be watching on your tablet. What, what strengths? What comes to mind? Life. You see life unfolding. It's true. You get to be um, you get to be an eyewitness. The other thing. Whoops. Where was I? On this one. Yeah. Okay. So studies studies for television. Um, when people have studied television. They have suggested, psychologists who've done studies, it's not a great medium for retaining information. So if I tell you, for example, about um, agricultural production in Tuscany, it's not going to be a great um, medium for giving you a lot of information. And next week, you're not going to remember very specific figures. However, if I tell you the story about a farm family, and maybe they're struggling. 
and maybe they're struggling because their production, their agricultural production is down that year. And you know, maybe they have several children and they're having trouble paying for uh, education. Um, that's a story that you might remember. And for television especially, it doesn't just appeal to the head, to the brain, it appeals to the heart. And the most effective kind of uh, television does that well. Immediacy as well. You're talking about uh, action, you're talking about timeliness. When something breaks, when a big story breaks, I mean, if you're talking about something contemporary or if you're talking about 9-11, for example, if you want to see what's happening, the impulse is to see pictures, to see visuals. You're not going to wait to read it, certainly, in the paper the next morning. You might want analysis, but if you want to be involved, you're going to go to a monitor. You're going to watch it. Um, so that's very important. And you become an eyewitness, therefore. Now, um, I'm going to show you a fairly short television piece uh, so we can talk about what the strengths are. Um, it's called Shooting Star. It was on NBC in the States. And it illustrates some of the strengths that we're talking about here. Um, you know, I'm thinking, I was told though that there was a problem with the video and I think Instead of showing it to you, I think this is going to be a discussion rather than a discussion that's illustrated by video. So as far as the, uh, this piece, I'm going to describe it to you. And I'm sorry I have to do that, but apparently the video isn't working. So in this piece, um, it's about um, a young boy who has Down syndrome. Do you know what Down syndrome is? People are nodding. OK. And he's fascinated with basketball, and he helps at his high school. He helps with the team at his high school. And he helps by bringing water and just by assisting, but he doesn't play. And then one day, he gets to play. And I think you can guess what happens. He suddenly, he, he just takes off. He says, it's as if I, I were on fire. And he starts scoring all these goals. And it does illustrate some of the strengths of television and what television does well. So when you start to think about that, some of the characteristics of good television stories, and I'm going to ask you after you see this list, if you want to add any, or if you disagree, I'm especially, just show of hands, how many of you work in video or television production in some way? Oh, so about half, about half, okay. So I think we can agree that some of the most powerful television stories you're ever going to see involve the heart, involve emotion. Very often, we look for good characters. It's character-driven. There's the really important question, who's affected? So for example, the story I mentioned, agricultural production in Tuscany, Who's affected by that story? It's not just a bunch of information. It's how it affects real people's lives. And that's what's so powerful, or can be so powerful, about television. Um, writing, of course. I think we can all agree, especially, uh, it doesn't matter where you work, that writing is absolutely crucial. And you're looking for the strongest possible writing um, visuals, it's a visual medium, and you can tell an amazing story with pictures. And one of the good tests of that is sometimes you just take the pictures, um, you just take the writing away, you take the script away, and you watch. And does it tell a good story as you watch? Um, audio too, never ever, I would suggest, forget the importance of sound and audio and how much texture and how much richness that adds to a good television story. Stakes. The question, what's at stake, is very important. And we'll talk a little more about that later. But if you're telling a story about 
again, that family in, in Tuscany. So if you're telling a story about the family, if they don't do well that agricultural season, then maybe they won't be able to afford to send the son or the daughter to the university. So there's really something at stake if that agricultural production uh, comes through, if it doesn't come through. We talked about immediacy, conflict, very important aspect of storytelling. Otherwise, um, you know the classic uh, fairy story, a fairy tale, the first kinds of stories we ever hear. Otherwise, if there's no conflict, it would be something like, once upon a time there was a prince, he wanted to marry a princess, he did. <laughs> the end. So no conflict whatsoever. So you're looking to see what are the different positions. If you're covering the school board, for example, if they're making decisions about funding, um, if the school board is opposed to more funding, if the parents really believe that that school needs more funds, more money to be able to do its job, terribly important. Um, Insight, what do I know now? If I give you my time uh, and I watch a piece on TV, whether it's two minutes long or whether you know it's a documentary, which is my area, so whether it's quite long and people are investing time, may, you know, maybe an hour, two hours, certainly 25 minutes or so in a documentary, what do they take away? What do they know now that they didn't know before? Um, Freshness, surprises, good stories that like, surprise me. The worst thing you can do is be boring and just repeat the same old thing over and over. So you're looking for that element of freshness and surprise. Um, humor has its place in television. I'm, I'm not saying that there are certain stories where, of course, you're not going to use humor. But it's something that sometimes can be used to good effect when you're talking about this. Um, tone, performance, very important as well. And those of you who are reporters will be especially aware of this. Now, anything on this list, before I continue, that you disagree with or anything that you think should be added to this kind of list? OK, so you're a very agreeable crowd. So. Um, So questions you want to ask when you're telling television stories. The biggest one, I think, why should I care? Why should I give you my time? Why should I care about this? Um, how does this connect to my life? And stories, if it's a story in Asia, for example, it can connect, if it's a human story, um, it can connect very clearly with the lives of viewers in, in Italy, in Canada, it depends how you tell the story. Um, now, when I'm talking, I'm hearing a little bit of reverberation here. Am I too close or too far from the mic? Or can, can you hear me at the back properly? And it sounds OK. You, it's not going boo boo It's not reverberating. <laughs> OK, good. Just checking. Um, and you think about, too, what keeps you watching? Because you can't assume that people are going to watch just because you produce the piece and just because you want them to. So these are important questions to ask. So we've talked a little bit about the attributes of good stories. And now in, I'm going to talk about two tools that you can use, those of you who do any kind of feature, whether it's a short feature for a news show, a magazine news show, or whether it's a, a documentary. Um, these are the tools that may be helpful. Because other characteristics of good stories, you need a strong focus. You need to know what your story is not about as much as you need to, to know what your story is about. So, for example, if you're doing a story, um, the teachers are out on strike. You're not going to necessarily interview someone um, who's saying, for example, that educational standards are low and there's a problem with educational standards. You know the who 
the what and the why of your story, and you go for that very clearly. So we'll talk about tours. Um, I want to get back to the fairy story first, and then I will apply it very directly to journalism. But we are talking about um, a specific journalistic form of storytelling. And usually, classically, as I mentioned, in the fairy tale, you have the main character. Very often in most traditional uh, fairy tales, it's a prince. Now, what I'm going to try and do here, let's see. So, you have the main character in your story, especially if it's a character-driven story, which many stories should be if you want strong stories. That character has a goal. So as I mentioned, the goal in the fairy tale might be prince, goal, marry, beautiful princess, perhaps. Um, but in order for that to be a story, you need to have helpers and hinderers. So just for fun, we're going to try this as an exercise because I don't have video to show you examples. So I'm going to bring out the flip chart. For this, I have to put down the mic for a few minutes so my hands are free. But I'll talk nice and loudly so that you can hear me while I do this. So let's try this. All right, you have to use the mic. I have to. Oh, I have to use the mic? All right, I hear I have to use the mic, so now I'm using the mic, but I can sometimes do two things at once, so I'm going to try and do this. So let's say your main character is a prince in the fairy story, and the prince wants, um, here, the prince wants to marry beautiful princess, because this is a very traditional, classic fairy tale, I have to say. Um, but to make it a story, there have to be helpers, and there have to be hinderers. So, there's no wrong answer to this. I just want you to throw out suggestions. Who is going to help the prince in this hypothetical fairy tale towards his goal? His horse, his horse of course. Harry the horse, okay. Thank you. Harry the horse is going to help him towards his goal. Who else is going to help the prince towards his goal? Magic. Who is magic? Very good. Okay, so let's call him Marvin. No, let's call him Marco. We're in Italy. So Marco the magician. Magician, yes. Who else? Oh, the, prin the princess's best friend. Okay, Thea, the best friend. <laughs> well, sometimes you can be both, but... <laughs> All right, who else is going to help the prince towards his goal? And before, actually, before you answer, let me tell you what you know already. In this story, if you're shooting this as a TV story, you already know who your main character is. Your main character is the prince. You know what his goal is. His goal is to marry the beautiful princess. You know that you're going to have to shoot with Harry the horse. You're going to have to shoot some scenes. Um, assuming that Harry is articulate, talks, you're going to have to shoot an interview with Harry. Um, Marco, the magician, you have to do the same thing. You're going to be shooting with Marco. You have to put that into your shooting schedule. Um, Thea, the best friend. Other helpers, people who will help the prince 
towards his goal. And then I promise I will take it back to journalism. But let's start here. So who else is going to help the prince towards his goal? Yes, his parents. So the king and queen, they're very supportive, let's say. But in this case, in this story, because this is our story, we can make them very supportive, OK. Um, Anything else? And it could actually be characteristics of the prince. It doesn't just have to be people. It could be something about the prince that's going to help him towards his goal. His looks? Okay, so let's say he looks like Trudeau. Yeah? Any other characteristics of the prince? <laughs> He's brave, okay. He's also brave. So here we have the prince, and you know now, when you're shooting, you have to be careful to shoot him properly so you can see that he looks like Trudeau. And in his behavior, you need to see that he's brave. So these help the prince towards his goal. What about hinderers? Because Without uh, hinderers, you don't have a story because you don't have conflict. And you do need conflict in a TV feature. So hinderers, what is going to hurt the prince in terms of his progress towards his goal? Drag. OK, I've got, I'll come to you in a second, but some, you said dragon? Oh, very good, OK. There's, OK, there's always, there's always got to be a dragon, so let's you know, Donald, dragon, twin sisters. Uh, twin sisters. Oh, yeah, stepmothers are good. I don't know, why is it always stepmothers and never stepfathers? You have to wonder. Okay, stepmothers. Another, oh, okay, a rival. A rival, Cecilia, the rival. Okay, um, other, who's best friend? Oh, the prince's best friend. Okay. So, uh, okay. So the prince's best friend. Oh, there's a rival. Um, oh, okay. So there's also a rival. And Agnes, and there's uh, Giovanni. Okay. Um, and any characteristics of the prince that may hurt him in terms of moving towards his goal? He's too proud? Good. And what else? Proud? He's proud. And I love it. I love it. OK. So he's proud and drug addicted. Oh, this is great. OK. So, so you know already you're building a good story. Because on one hand, you have Harry the horse, but you have the dragon. You have Thea, the best friend, but you also have Agnes, the rival. You have Marco, the magician, but you have twin sisters. Oh, the witch, okay. Witch, okay. Um, you have the king and queen, but they've got a witch to confront. He may look like Trudeau, but he's very proud, not to mention drug addicted. <laughs> so you know already that you have, you've got a story, you've got the main, character to tell the story, you've got the goal, you've got helpers, and you've got hinderers. So to take this back to the journalism for a second, this is called the narrative table. And this is a technique that's used at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the CBC. It may be used other places, I'm not sure. But when I did training at, at CBC, and when I do training, um, it is a technique in Canada that people use called the narrative table. Um, so let's, let's uh, take it to a journalistic story. Would someone like to suggest some kind of story that they may have been working on or grappling with where it's a feature? Um, I, I don't mean daily news because this isn't a strong model for daily news, but it is for features. And let's see how we might apply that to, uh, to a feature. Can you think of one? If you can't, I'll give you one.
They could not marry. Okay, well, let's talk about that one for a minute. And then after that one, I may bring it back to the, um, the family and let's say agricultural family in Umbria. But um, what, um, what was suggested here in the front row was if you have a story and you said it happened in India, Okay, so this is a story in India where, um, because of social barriers, because, you know, as I'm, I'm sure you know, it's a very caste-driven society, somebody, a, a man wanted to marry a woman who was perhaps in a different caste, and because of the social barriers was unable to. Um, if you're telling that story as a journalistic story in India, then your main character would be the man who wants to marry the, the woman from a different caste, so we know what the goal is. And there are actually some similarities. You know, you know who the hinderers are in that society. The fact that it's a caste-driven society and class is so important in that society. And if you are upper caste, it's very difficult to marry below. You're going to have hinderers from the family. You're going to have the cousin you know, who's in the village, the next village. You're going to have brothers. You're going to have all kinds of people who are going to stop, uh, try and stop the marriage. On the other hand, helpers, um, if the groom wants to marry the lower caste woman, he may have some very supportive friends. There may be organizations in India, for example, that are working to make it more level, more, um, more equal, so that those kinds of marriages don't pose huge problems. So that would be one way. And if you get the assignment, say you get the assignment that day, this is not time consuming. This is something that you can just jot down really quickly or you can, you know, you can bang out on your tablet really, really fast to identify a main character, to think what the goal is, to think who the helpers and hinderers will be. And take another example. Let's say there's a, oh, did this run dry? Okay, let's do this one. Okay. Sort of works. Y yeah, you can see it? Okay. All right, sort of. All right, so, so if you have the family, the agricultural family, and let's put them this time in Umbria, um, you could have as your main character, it could be the actual family group. I won't draw it, but I'll describe it. So you could have the family group, or you could have a member of the family. The goal is to increase agricultural production to make money to be able to send the oldest daughter who wants to be a teacher to university. You start thinking, who are the helpers? Who are the hinderers on this narrative table? So to help the family, obviously a helper would be a good harvest that year. Another helper would be the hard work, the characteristic of the family, the hard work that the family is prepared to put in to achieve this goal. Um, there might be neighbors or family who are supportive. Um, there might be a local organization. Perhaps there's an organization that, a, a welfare organization. So that organization might be able to supply money there might be a way of um, giving scholarships, so the daughter might be able to obtain a scholarship. But as you're doing your research, you're thinking this through. Um, on the other hand, hinders the family's financial circumstances, a bad harvest, the fact that university tuition, um, I don't know, by the way, is university tuition at all expensive in Italy? It may not be. I'm just using this as an example. Who's here from Italy? Is it expensive to go to university? No? OK. Oh, it's free. OK. So we're going to say an agricultural family in Canada then, <laughs> where it is more expensive. So let's say scholarships, bursaries. Um, there are ways of doing this. But the goal with the narrative table is to rigorously think through your feature. and 
to think it through in pre-production before you're even out in the field shooting the piece, you can think this through. It's a way of asking yourself, what is the focus of the story? What is the who, what, and why of the story? So for example, with the prince, um, the prince wants to marry the princess, um, the beautiful princess, because he thinks it's time to start a family and have an heir to the kingdom. Or the family wants to increase agricultural production because they want to send their daughter to university. So who, what, why? Central character, helpers and hinderers. Yeah. This is a suspense mounts. Oh, thank you. All right. All right. That's great. Thanks. Um, okay. So that's the narrative table. And before I proceed, are there any clarifications or any questions about this very simple tool that you can use, especially when you don't have a lot of time and you want to think through your feature? And I think you can apply it, whether you're doing something really simple online, and it's really short, you still have um, the impetus to tell a really good story. And this is a tool that can help you do that. So is there anything at all that's confusing, or you disagree with, or you want clarification? Yeah. Is it boring when there is no hinderer? Um, that's a really good question. Is it boring when there's no hinderer? I'll throw the question out first. I have some thoughts on that. But what do the rest of you think? If you're watching a piece and there are no obstacles to overcome, is it boring? It's not satisfying. It's not satisfying, no. Because when people overcome obstacles, it's like a quest. Um, you know, I, I do agree. I do agree. Now, there will be a time, and especially for those of you who work in daily news, Sometimes this construction won't work um, the same way in daily news because sometimes you just need to give people information. But even then, even then, I think by asking who's affected by the information you're conveying, you can still think in terms of stories, not just news reports. Now the second, um, oh, were there other, thank you, were there other questions about any of this? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Where there are a lot of things that uh, go wrong, and it's kind of hard to find the positive thing. Yes. And who's writing it is affected. It, even that's a problem, right? <laughs> and who's affected? You mean the the person who's telling the story? It's a life. It's a true to life story with a lot of things that go wrong. So it's hard to look at the sunny side. Yeah. Oh, you don't have to. You're telling a story. It, uh, there's no sunny side or dark side necessarily. So it's not. You're t it's a feature. It is journalism. So it may be a story, uh, a journalistic story that doesn't have a sunny side. Do you want to give an example? Mm, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can't give the example. But your point about I mean, I the could, sunny but I can't. side, it's not um, always No, like I would that. think that it might be a little bit um, depressing for someone to see so many things that go wrong and uh, lots of things that aren't very nice. And, and so it might mm -hmm. be um, a little depressing to read that. I yeah. mean, we're reading depressing things all the that, time. To watch that. Yeah. Well, OK, let's think about that. Um, overcoming obstacles always at the heart, I think, of the best stories. Um, people overcome, sometimes they don't overcome, but often they do overcome obstacles. So that part is often heartening. So if you're telling the story of the family, um, the agricultural family, it may be that the harvest doesn't improve, but you don't know what's going to happen. This is journalism. Maybe the daughter will get a scholarship. Maybe she won't get a scholarship. But it's um, when you're talking about obstacles and overcoming obstacles, I think sometimes that can be inspiring. And even 
people's efforts to overcome obstacles are inspiring. I guess a classic example of that might be sports stories, because sports stories are cla often classic overcoming stories. Anyone here work in sports, by the way? No. Um, classic overcoming stories. So if you have, I'll, I'll use hockey because I'm from Canada, but if you have a hockey player and he, he loses, and he loses often, um, the effort is often interesting. So just the fact that he's, he goes out there and he puts himself out there every game, and maybe he's lost five games, but he's gonna give it his all. You know, I don't see that personally as depressing. Um, and also, I'm not sure as journalists it's our job. Some, st I mean, so many stories are really troubling and they have to be out there in the world, whether, the, whether people find them depressing or not. So uh, that's a, an interesting topic for a story meeting. You know, if you're meeting at the beginning of, um, of the day, talking about stories to go to air, I guess that is a question in terms of what your audience wants and demands. But also there is an agenda, you know, what's out there, and some of it will be unfortunately quite depressing. Anyway, this is the, uh, uh, um, thanks for the question. Um, are there any other questions about the narrative table before I move on to the second tour? Yeah. Thank you. Um, with the narrative table, obviously it's a really good way of making it more appealing and more popular, which I'm sure is really important with TV features. But to what extent does it actually diminish the truth of the story, either by sensationalizing it or? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a good question, and I wondered that. I have to tell you, the first time I heard about this, um, I was sitting, you know, decades ago, I guess, I was sitting in a group, and somebody got up, a trainer got up, and said, well, I'm going to start by talking about fairy tales. And I thought, exactly, um, it was exactly my reaction was, well, what about truth? But I can tell you, it's really important, I think. Um, we're journalists, and truth has to be at the center. So what I'm suggesting is um, truth, of course, has to take precedence. It's a way of thinking through a way to tell a story in an engaging and interesting way. But you're not going to compromise truth at any point. So if, if the story, um, if the agricultural family is actually you know, they're doing quite well. You're not going to exaggerate their trials and tribulations. It has to be always your duty, and my duty, everybody's duty as a journalist, of course, is to be factually accurate and to tell the truth. But I think you can do that within an interesting and an engaging story format, yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, for the, uh, as a social media user, how we uh, how we like uh, make uh, some for anti-narrative counterattack from social media. You know, when there's a, like a feature, yeah. okay, it's already air on television, and then people talking about that story, but it's like make a negative review. So it's like they give another perspective of your story. Yes. So because you build a narrative. They interpret it. You mean yeah. the story is out there on social yeah. media, mm -hmm. and then someone might share it, or someone might tweet something. Yeah, is it gonna be like the anti-narrative of your feature? Well, unfortunately, that happens sometimes. I mean, you know, the responsibility is to make sure that you, you set the record straight and you get it right. But once it's out there in the public sphere, you don't have control about what other people do with it, unfortunately. But it's a good point in, in terms of how social media can be used and how stories sometimes get distorted. Um, so what I want to do now is the first tool then is the narrative table. And that's a pre-production tool to think through focus and to, to rigorously think through who the people are you'll need to interview, um, what needs to be included at the pre-production level. However, the second tool I want to talk about is called the whale. And it's a way in um, 
post-production of structuring your television story. Hang on one sec. Okay, so I'm just gonna draw, wait, text. I'm gonna draw it over here, hang on. So, book context. and time tension. Um, I should write this along here. Okay, so the very first thing you're going to do, this is a way, I mean, in its simplest form, the whale and I still don't like that one. I'm just going to do one more. But it's a way of saying that every good story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There, that's better. OK, so to begin, to begin your story, hook. The very first thing you need to do, regardless of the format, how you're telling your story, you need to get people into the tent. You need to get people interested. You need to get people to say, okay, I could be watching this, I could be watching that, I could click on this, but I'm going to watch your story. So it's about what you see at the beginning, it's about your character, how interesting is your central character. It could start with something provocative in terms of information, but it's the opening of your story. That's the hook. Now, the second thing that happens is context. And this can be a real problem, because if you've done all this fantastic research, a lot of people believe that you got to get it all in there. And you can get bogged down in all kinds of information. So to give an example, the hook, um, the hook for the fairy story once upon a time, right? It's the classic hook. It brings you in. You might, as part of the hook, you might meet the prince. You might appreciate that he looks like Justin Trudeau. Um, you start, the story starts to unfold. So the hook, context. What do you need to know to follow the story? Um, so if the hook for the agricultural story is and we'll say then it's a Canadian family, they want to send their daughter to university. So you might open and you might see the daughter and she's studying, she's studying in her room. Um, she's obviously working really hard. And then downstairs, maybe the parents are sitting at a table and they're looking at bills and whatnot. That's the way you might hook into the story. For context, what is the bare minimum information you need to follow the story. So the context might be when you learn some very simple facts, that this is the, the story of the, the Jones family. They live in Alberta, Canada. So far, they've been doing quite well. Um, as they've been growing wheat. But this year, the harvest has failed. It's a really bad harvest. And you learn that their daughter, who's working so hard upstairs, wants to go to university, but the money isn't available. Now, development. As you develop your story, this is development here. This is where the narrative table plays out. So this is where you learn all about the helpers and the hinderers, and how they affect the outcome of the story. Then you get up here. This is the climax of the story, the, the high point of the story. And it's very much a function of your focus statement in the narrative table. So if you've said that in this story, the, the Jones family of Alberta struggles to produce a good harvest so they can send their daughter to university. 
It's the clearest expression of that statement. So there may be a point where the daughter goes online, opens an email, and finds out, oh, she's got a scholarship. It's all going to be OK. Or it may be the point where the family just realizes that, you know what? It's the, the harvest is terrible. There's no way they're going to be able to, to help the daughter. But whatever the outcome is, journalistically, it's the clearest expression of that focus statement at the top of the narrative table. Then after that, you're moving down here to the wrap. The wrap is where you see how it all comes together or doesn't, a sense of what's going to happen next, a sense of what it all means. So you have your hook, your context, your development, your climax, and your wrap, the whale. Whereas the narrative table is used in pre-production, so you can clearly think through how you're going to tell your story. This is very useful when you're thinking about how to edit your story. Because you can think to yourself, OK, what's really strong here? How can I hook people into this story? Um, what do they need to know? What is the bare minimum that they need to know to be able to follow this story? There may be other information, and you can dole out the information slowly as you go. But what is the information right at the beginning of the feature that you need to be able to tell this story? Development. Here's where the conflicts play out. And in almost every story, I think you will find there is conflict. If it's the school board deciding about financing for the Board of Education, um, whatever the story is, if it's a story about a strike, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be helpers. Um, you will find helpers and hinderers. Where does the story land? What is the high point of the story when you realize where it's been going, whether it works out, whether it doesn't work out? What is that point? And finally, how does it all come together? What does it mean? How does it wrap? So this tool is called the, the whale. So are there any questions about that? Is that clear? Could you see? I want you to think, those of you, the half of you, who do work in this area, I'd like you to just take a second and think about a story that you may be working on or you may have worked on recently. And just think if you could have applied the narrative table or the whale to that story. Because I, I'd like to make sure that everything's clear and that it, you know, it sinks in a little bit. And if you do, um, if you have a story that you could have applied the narrative table or the whale to, I'd like you to tell me what, or tell us what that might have been. Anybody struggling with a story lately, a feature? It's gone really smoothly, has it? So no, no struggles with stories. OK. Um, I will then. Let's see how we're doing for time. Hang on a sec. Oh, five. Oh, it's just, it's just five minutes. So I will, I was going to use the, the last little bit for questions. So if you have questions about any area of storytelling, um, do ask. Um, and if not, we, this will be the, the wrap portion of the, of the session. OK? Yeah. I would like to ask you what about the time? What's the best, how long it should be, uh, for example, a documentary, not to become boring <laughs> for the audience? Okay. Um, okay, good question. I would say it's, it's what it sustains, because some documentaries deserve two hours, and I think you've all seen them. I think some you know, deserve maybe 25 minutes. Some deserve less. It's a question of what is interesting to your audience. So 
you will be in a position to to make that decision, uh, it would be very, very hard to say that for a feature it should be a certain amount of time. However, I do think that people sometimes make the mistake of going longer just because that's what the newsroom might require or their TV station might require. And you can feel it when people are producing um, a piece and they're stretching and they're putting in you know, interviews that really don't belong there. So generally, I think you often don't go wrong by going shorter rather than longer. Thank you. Okay, and thank you all. Been a pleasure talking to you today.